Thank you so much to the organizers for the opportunity to contribute to this great meeting again. Um, my task today is to give you a brief overview of what's new for 2021 in pediatric HIV treatment and prevention, and I'll do so from the WHO perspective. So I'll tell you a little bit more about um, where countries are with policy adoption, share some of the updates from the 2021 WHO consolidated guidelines, and give you a flavor of what's coming in terms of research and development. So let's start from what's happening in countries. There's a lot of work that is going on right now. As you can see on this slide, on the left, list of the 21 priority countries, and on the top, a number of policies that we have monitored. I'd like to really note how encouraging it is to see so many countries not just adopting dolutegravir for children above 20 kilos in first line, but also being well ahead in implementing and scaling it up nationally. We know that many of these countries are also expanding these policies to children below 20 kilos, and as the Rutegravir becomes available in countries, they will start to implement, and some of them are ready on the way to do so. There is a few countries that have been a bit skeptical or cautious in adopting the Rutegravir for second line with a desire of um, retaining the Rutegravir for a later use, but we see that there is a wider policy adoption and soon uh, implementation to be followed. Uh, we also know that the silver lining of the COVID-19 pandemic and the disruptions that have resulted from it is that uh, countries more broadly adopted uh, multi-month dispensing for children. And as you can see, there's a number of differences in terms of the way they implemented it. But in general, most countries adopted these policies for children above two years with multi-month dispensing of three months. We also know that more and more countries are introducing point of care for infant diagnosis, but we also know that implementation is not going as fast as we want, and so really more work to be done there. And disappointingly to see that biological testing in nine months, which was a new element of the 2018 infant diagnosis algorithm, hasn't really been picked up as it needed to be. And this is really important because it's a new it is, is an additional time point to make sure that we don't miss infants um, that are infected. This year, we've also looked at the implementation of enhanced postnatal prophylaxis and noted that two out of the three countries that were reviewed have implemented the risk-based approach according to WHO recommendation. But a third of them actually decided to go for a simplified approach and have the same approach for all children, irrespective of risk. We also noted that adaptation uh, was pretty wide and um, we see that the combination of drugs and the duration of prophylaxis has been quite different in different countries. And so really a note to show how these specific recommendations required uh, important adaptation uh, to the epidemic context. Overall, we are seeing transition to optimal regimen continuing and acceleration is expected as pediatric dolutegravir becomes available in countries. We are also seeing COVID-related disruptions um, uh, encouraging the shift to MMD. And um, we hope that really as uh, restrictions are lifting uh, and the pandemic hopefully going uh, to resolve, uh, we would like to really see this uh, policy to be retained. Enhanced postnatal prophylaxis implementation is challenged by risk-based approaches that appear to be complex in many contexts and stockouts that have been reported over the last couple of years. Uh, from the data that Ma Mary shared with us today, uh, it's very clear that we still need to do work in identifying children, and that remains an important gap. And so really intensifying our work on index case testing is going to be critical. And not just that, but also provide a more extended approach a package of care to all children that are living with HIV, not focusing just on ART, but also providing the interventions that are needed to ensure that they not just survive, but also uh, really uh, grow and reach their full potential. We know there are a number of platforms that are available for countries to exchange good practices and try to address together some of the common challenges that they're facing. And we hope that they will continue to use these channels as we go ahead. Let's now move into the WHO 2021 guidelines um, that are really giving us the opportunity to emphasize a recommendation that were launched earlier this year around the use of point of care 
infant diagnosis. Um, and as you can see, uh, we now have a much stronger recommendation that is built on high quality evidence that suggests that by using point of care, you can really accelerate treatment initiation in infants. And this recommendation comes together with important consideration about how we continue to strengthen lab-based uh, approaches so that we um, can really provide strengthened EID services, even in settings where point of care is not yet available. Point of care is also now recommended for viral load monitoring, in particular for priority population, among which we also have infants, children, and adolescents. And we now have a revised, a slightly revised viral load algorithm, which I want to note uh, include uh, rapid transition to second line for those uh, that have uh, are still on an NRTI-based regimen and have one elevated viral load without confirmatory secondary uh, viral load. We've also had the chance to strengthen our optimization uh, component in the guidelines, stronger language on dolutegravir as a recommended anchor drug for first and second line, uh, benefiting from the stronger results uh, coming out of the Odyssey trial. And I wanna give you a heads up for some of the presentation that will happen during the course of this conference um, with regards to the cohort of children below 14 kilos. We've also product provided new guidance on regimens and dose adjustment when rifampicin-based TB therapy is used with dolutegravir and provided guidance on transition to dolutegravir uh, for children that are established and, and well on uh, their first and second line with a particular attention to those that are still on an NRTI-based regimen or need TB treatment or are struggling with their lupinum and ritonavir solid formulations all of this in the context of viral load monitoring being good practice for patient care, but also the importance for it to not be a delayed a reason to delay transition to better regimens. And finally, a simplified nevirapine dosing approach for enhanced prophylaxis and extended prophylaxis where countries may wish to do so. And some options in case of stockouts, both for nevirapine and EZT that are now being provided. We also know that our guidelines come together with a number of tools. Um, earlier this year, we launched the Optimal Formulary. Today, we're launching the Transition Brief to support countries to um, introduce new regimens and then ARV dosing annex again being included in WHO guidelines and being the foundation for what will be the ARV dosing dashboard where we count to go live in September, where you will find live updates on any dosing recommendation and, and thorough explanations about uh, the rationale for some of our recommendations. And uh, finally, a uh, postnatal package of care brief that where we hope to touch on uh, use of postnatal prophylaxis and cotrimoxazole in HIV exposed uh, infants. Uh, in terms of uh, broadening the package of care, clearly these guidelines gave us an opportunity to uh, include a new recommendation on early ART initiation for children that are diagnosed with TB, tackling advanced HIV disease with a stop AIDS package that we launched last year, but also with new implementation considerations on the use of cotrimoxazole, uh, really to allow for a shorter uh, duration of cotrimoxazole in settings where there is very low transmission rates and um, very good retention in the testing to treatment cascade for infants. And lastly, inclusion of an important section, new section on pediatric uh, non-communicable diseases um, that include um, reflections on monitoring, assessment, and management of various conditions, including growth and developmental delays, uh, psychosocial and mental issues, as well as cardiac, lung, renal, and neurocognitive disease. Overall, to strive to uh, really provide services that allow children not just to survive, but also to transform and reach their full potential. We know our service delivery guidelines have been updated um, with a strengthened recommendation with uh, ART initiation now uh, to be started even outside of the health facility, good practice uh, statements to um, support uh, same day ART initiation and any effort to bring back um, children once they fall out of care but also revalidated recommendation around less frequent clinical visits and less frequent ARV pickups. Um, now let's move to research and development. 
Mm, I think that it's very clear to all of us how the pediatric dolutegravir story is really a great story for us as a pediatric community to learn from. Uh, the tremendous work done by the IMPACT and the PENTA network in generating the evidence and share that rapidly with WHO so that we could change our guidelines and take that to other countries so that they could adopt as quickly as possible um, the new recommendations but also with accelerated timelines for approval for children about four weeks and three kilos that uh, were resulting from a lot of work done by the innovator and then uh, collaborative work by Chai, uh, Unitaid and the generic manufacturers that allowed development of generic versions of the Lutegavir 10 milligram score dispersible tablets with a price deal which now reduced by 75% the total cost of HIV treatment for children. And today, we know that um, the Lutegavir 10 milligram score tablets has arrived in six countries and will be in 19 countries by the end of the year. So that's really fantastic news. And we need to use this as to set an example for anything that we want to develop in the future. We know that the priority products to be focusing on are included in the PADO list which to this year will be updated. We are in particularly looking at uh, special um, attention to neonatal treatment and prevention, focusing on new classes and new technologies, but also considering treatment and prevention of co-infections. This year we'll use new methodology that hopefully will help us to get more of your input into the process. And we count to share with you the outcome of the part of five meeting um, by the end of the year with you all. So watch the space. This work will build on an important collaboration we've initiated with the Implant Network to look into postnatal prophylaxis a little bit further, starting from whether we still need postnatal prophylaxis in the context of the current maternal ART landscape, but also if we do need postnatal prophylaxis, what else can we do to make it easier and more effective? Um, what are the other products that we need to consider in the future to make it um, more manageable for programs to implement? And, what are the methodologies that we need to deploy to be able to investigate these options more rapidly and inform uh, policies more globally? We know that so far the work we've done with IMPACT um, is telling us that uh, the ART landscape for mothers is rapidly evolving. It's very encouraging to see that so many women are already in ART when they get pregnant and many of them are on TLD and present biological suppression. But we know that too many new infections are still occurring and therefore postnatal prophylaxis remain still needed. There is limited evidence that we have available to inform the most optimal approaches on that. But there are a number of considerations we can keep in mind with regards to how postnatal prophylaxis might need to be slightly different depending on the context where you are. For example, in high burden settings with optimally performing programs, a more nuanced approach, a risk-based with uh, more complex regimens may be possible. And yet in a high burden setting with suboptimal performing programs, simplicity has to be the key to success. This is similar to concentrated epidemic, which is often driven by key population epidemic uh, where simplicity and tailored service delivery will be critical. And finally, high income countries where certainly a more granular approach is possible, but new challenges might be on the horizon as we, in, uh, as we support women to um, continue to breastfeed throughout uh, in the postnatal period. Um, there are a number of ways we could go about postnatal prophylaxis in the future. We could optimize current ARV options or really jump to the future and uh, consider new options that include potentially not giving anything to these babies because maybe mothers are receiving long-acting formulations of ARVs and are able to be biologically suppressed entirely. Clearly more work to be done on this topic. Um, what are the preferred characteristics for these products, but also what are the methodologies to investigate uh, this in the most effective way. So um, really more important work to be done in the next few months. And we're not just looking at uh, neonates, we're also looking at their mothers. And this is another important collaboration we're having with IMPACT that will be discussed, I think, later on by Shaheen, um, but that we will describe more fully at, at our satellite on Sunday. So we really welcome you all to join us there. And, and the goal there is very much to generate better and more rapidly uh, uh, evidence to support the use of new ARVs in pregnant and lactating women. 
So to conclude, I think it's very clear that we see important signals on the ground that things are changing, yet uh, important gaps remain. And so our efforts need to be sustained. We need to continue to learn and share uh, uh, what's happening on the ground. And as uh, we getting through the COVID pandemic, ensure that we maximize the opportunities uh, for contact with the health facility and provide all the services that children and their families need. Hopefully, WHO Consolidated Guidelines provide strengthened guidance on how to improve ART, but also to how to expand the package of care. And finally, research and development work that many of us are doing right now will help us to leapfrog into a new era where better solutions will be available, not just for infant children, but also for their mothers. So it's clear that there is more to do, but we know we can do it because we've done it. And there's a lot of work that has happened already that we can build on. And I think that uh, we as a, a pediatric community have really shown how when we join forces, we can really tackle the very difficult issues. So um, good luck to everyone and the work ahead. But uh, I want to thank every my colleagues that have contributed to this presentation and um, all of you for your attention. And I wish you a great rest of the workshop.